cerebrovascular disease, the only test we had available to do for them at first was something called a pneumoencephalogram. Which one move over a little bit? A pneumoencephalogram. Selfie, selfie. Selfie. No, that's important to everybody, isn't it? Pneumoencephalograms were horrible procedures and so on. And all of a sudden, when I was a, I think, a fourth year student or, or, a, uh, or an intern, angiography came along. If you had any kind of cerebrovascular problem, they stuck some dye into your neck. And if there was anything there, they took you to the operating room and tried to do a procedure to fix the artery. That didn't work too well either. We have come a long way since that time. We have CAT scans, we have MRIs, we have angiograms that are a lot more gentle than the old ones were. And we are fortunate enough to have somebody here who knows all about this stuff. Dr. Gary Bernardini is nationally known in terms of uh, vascular, cerebral vascular disease. And he will discuss strokes in general as well, you know, both uh, arteriosclerotic ones, I presume, uh, hemorrhagic ones and so on, TIAs and various things like that and other neurologic topics that might come up along the line. He is a uh, associate professor, did they promote you? Full. You're full professor? He is now a full professor of neurology at Wild Cornell Medical School and that is not easy to accomplish. Dr. Bernardini. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Uh, would you prefer to get If people want to ask questions, you want them to raise <coughs> their hands or sure. you want to wait till the end? No, during, during the talk. Okay. It's so raise your hand. Fine. Put this thing selfie. So raise your hand. Okay. I, I can see myself, I think. So. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come talk to you tonight. Uh, I have a, a talk I call The Whirlwind of Stroke. So we're going to talk about a lot of topics tonight. and. We'll try to get to all of them, and if you have questions as we go along that might pertain to some somebody you know, or you personally, or anybody, feel free to ask, and we're going to get started. And unfortunately, the screen cut off a little bit, but, you know, we will make do. Um, as Dr. Bright says, we've come a long way. So I graduated from residency in 1996, and... At that time, a couple of years leading up to that, the treatment we had for stroke was aspirin. So if you came, and we actually had CAT scans, so if you came into the emergency room, you'd get a CAT scan. If it didn't show a bleed, you had a regular type of stroke and you got put on aspirin. And then you went to rehab. And then you, when you came back from rehab, if you had another stroke, we would double the dose of the aspirin and send you to rehab. Well, those days are gone, thank you very much. We have a lot that we can do to, to treat stroke acutely. The key in all of this is getting to the hospital in time. So I don't, I'm not going to go too much into symptoms and signs, but a stroke is you lose your speech, you can't move one side of your body, your, or your speech changes, you lose vision, and you think it's one eye or both eyes, you suddenly can't walk or you have a bad headache. All of those could be stroke. And the best thing you can do is not call your primary care. The best thing you do is dial 911, have the ambulance pick you up, take you to the closest hospital. Now, my hospital is near Presbyterian Queens, we're a primary stroke center. There's many primary stroke centers in the area. I'm very biased, obviously, so come to my hospital and we provide the best care. So we're going to talk pretty soon about cutting edge. What we have now is we have devices that go in very effectively and pull clots out of brain vessels. That's one type of treatment. And we'll talk a little bit about the history in just a second. We have imaging, so not only CAT scans, but we have MRI scans, and we have perfusion scans. So we look at where the blood is going, where it's not going, and it sort of helps us make the diagnosis. We have TPA, so TPA um, came about in 1995, and I, I can tell you, I, I told you, I graduated neurology residency in 1996. I was at a, um, a journal club with Fred Plum, who was chair of neurology at the time, famous international neurologist. And we reviewed in a journal club the, the New England Journal of Medicine article that talked about TPA to treat stroke. And we thought, isn't that nice? Maybe we got something secondary to addition to treat stroke besides the aspirin we were giving. And in fact, this is now become, this is the standard of care for treatment of stroke. So if you get to the hospital in time, and in most people, the window is now extended out to four and a half hours. So what I mean the window, you're sitting in your, in your kitchen, all of a sudden, your loved one, your cousin, somebody slumps over, they get weak. You look at your watch, 8 o'clock, you call 911, they go to the hospital. They arrive in the hospital within four and a half hours, 
In most cases, they'll be eligible for TPA as long as it's not a bleed in the brain. We'll talk about that as well. We have other prevention therapies. You want to control the blood pressure. You want to treat anticoagulation if you have AFib, and you want to put, be put on antiplatelets. So the, the, the mainstay and the, the treatment we've had a stroke for decades is very important to prevent another stroke. You want to treat the risk factors. Here's the data. So stroke has actually fallen now to the fifth leading cause of death, and it was fourth uh, in 2014, and now it's fifth. So we're doing a better job, and uh, but we still have a ways to go. There's four million stroke survivors. The mortality rate is still a quarter of all strokes, and so we're getting there. Um, this shows you the type of strokes that exist. So we're going to talk tonight about embolic stroke, the regular stroke. You have a blockage of a blood vessel. You don't get blood to a certain part of the brain, you're going to have a stroke. But there are other types of strokes. One is a bleed. So if you have uncontrolled high blood pressure, you can have a bleed in the brain. And this white area on a CAT scan shows you an interstitial hemorrhage. Or you can have a ruptured aneurysm in the brain. So your aneurysm is in the brain. You may not know you have it. You have sudden onset, the worst headache of your life. You go into the hospital, get a CAT scan, and, and then show subarachnoid the blood. But we're really going to focus on ischemic stroke, which is about 80% of the strokes. The stroke risk factor is very important. Really, the nuts and bolts of preventing a stroke, preventing another stroke, is controlling risk factors. So my picture here. Unfortunately, as we all age, that's an independent risk factor. Genetics, if you have someone in your family who's had a stroke at a young age, and I'm only talking 40s and 50s, someone young stroke, young age, that puts you, if you're a first degree relative, at risk. Uh, from, um, gender and ethnicity, there's certain types of strokes that run in certain ethnic groups. Um, we're going, coming right into the football season, so we all know what that's about, right? Couch potato. So if you're a couch potato, inactive, you may be obese, you may have high blood pressure, you may be a diabetic, that's a risk factor. Drinking, and really talking binge drinking, cigarette smoking, risk factor. You know, there's a laser pointer, I think. What's that? There's a laser pointer. Oh, there is. Uh, yeah. Um, blood pressure, this looks really good to eat, but it's loaded with cholesterol. Having a prior TIA or stroke increases your risk. Heart disease, and really we're talking really atrial fibrillation. It's cut off here, but it shows your atrial fibrillation. Diabetes, obesity, and then young women. Young women on oral contraceptives that smoke, about a two to three fold risk of stroke above the general population. So we see young women that come in and have stroke, and we say, well, you know, I thought stroke was an, was an elderly person. It's not at all. We see there are children that have stroke for different reasons. And so stroke can affect all different ages. We have imaging. So um, the CAT scan, Dr. Bright talked about the pneumoencephalogram, very painful, because when you put air up in the brain, it stretches all the pain receptors, and so it's a very painful procedure. So CAT scan came into being, I think, in the 80s. And so we have a CAT scan. It still is a workhorse. So if you come into the emergency room and we think that you're having a stroke, you're going to get a CAT scan. And it's a really useful, useful thing because it does show you if you have blood or not. So if you have a regular type of stroke or do you have a hemorrhage type of stroke. Uh, we have all this other imaging that's very helpful. MRIs, CT angiography has replaced the conventional angiogram looking at blood vessels transcranial Doppler is an ultrasound, and we still have conventional angiogram to, to do in some, some patients. This shows you, this is kind of cut off, but it shows you a, a non-invasive uh, transcranial Doppler. This is an ultrasound, and we can actually look at brain vessels and see if there's a clot in a brain vessel, and we have this technology. Dr. Koifman, who I know has been here speaking not too long ago, does this. He's, he runs the lab. And then we still have conventional angiograms, so they inject dye and you see where blood goes or doesn't go. Right here, there's a vessel that's cut off on the left side of the brain. There's no blood flow going there, so that's a stroke about to happen, unless you open up that vessel. This is a CAT scan. A CAT scan ordinarily doesn't show stroke in the first 24 hours, so it's pretty insensitive. It does show hemorrhage, very sensitive for hemorrhage, but it doesn't show regular stroke. So you come in, this person came in, 
And if I tell you a CAT scan is the opposite, so this is right, this is left side. This person at 24 hours or repeat CAT scan showed a very large right hemispheric stroke, but not so much in the initial CAT scan. And so someone that came in that had a normal CAT scan and fit the criteria would get this TPA, would get this medication that we call a clot buster. And sometimes a regular CAT scan we can see blockage of blood vessel. I have a, um, see how many, there we go. I have a, a slide that is sort of tongue in cheek, but it's a slide that shows a guy, a plumber, and it says this is all about the plumbing. So in stroke, you can really simplify. It's all about the plumbing. It's getting that blood vessel open. Blood vessels blocked. You're going to have a stroke. How do we get the blood vessel? How do we get the plumbing open? You know, rotor rotor. Let's pull that clot out of the vessel and keep someone from having a stroke. This is a very um, good technology that we have. This is an MRI scan, and the stroke is bright white on the scan. And someone had asked me before we started, do we have to know part, what parts of the brain are injured? We look at that MRI scan, and we know what what areas that controls. So, for example, this is an area of the basal ganglia. And we know that controls motor function. So this person has a stroke. Again, left side of the brain, we control right side. So mostly they may be weak on the right side. They may have facial droop, be weak on the right side as well. And so there's the stroke. This is a perfusion scan that shows a larger area of blood is, uh, brain that's not getting blood. So this would be a patient we'd want to open up that vessel and get the blood going again. So I'll show you a case. A 59-year-old man had hypertension, diabetes, didn't take his medication, not such a great thing. Had sudden onset of left arm and face <coughs> weakness. Blood pressure was high. This is supposed to be less than 140 over 90, and it was high. Heart rate was okay. He, he was in a normal science rhythm. And we did an echocardiogram in the heart, and there was no clot in the heart. So this turned out to be what's called small vessel. This is a very, called lacoon which just means a small stroke here in this white area. And we did imaging, and all the imaging looked, uh, of vessels looked okay. So very small vessels in the brain over time with uncontrolled hypertension, or you're a smoker, or you're a diabetic, get injured, and you can get these small strokes in the brain. And so we control the blood pressure, we control the diabetes, and we put the patient on an antiplatelet agent called clopidogrel, where it works as good as aspirin. Okay, well that's interesting. I don't have much to say about this slide. But we're protected, so that's good to know. Question? Yes? Do I have a question on the, uh, can you go back to one slide? Sure. So when you say small stroke, uh, small stroke, right. so you just treat it in with Exactly. Is it is it what? Yeah. So that it doesn't uh, get bigger. Yes. Yeah. Most patients come into the hospital and they stay in the hospital about three to five days after a stroke. So there's an observation period, and and any what we found is this type of stroke. If it's going to get better, uh, sorry, bigger, it'll get bigger in the first 24, 48 hours. So we watch the patient very closely, follow the exam very closely, make sure it hasn't changed. If it has changed, we'll repeat the MRI scan and just see if that has gotten any bigger. And so then how would you know that to discharge the patient and the patient still has a stroke? Well, they're going to have a stroke, and they'll have this from now on. So this part of the brain is injured. That'll never come back, but they recover. So you say, well, how does someone recover from the stroke? Well, believe it or not, other parts of the brain around that damaged area take over the function. So there is some pliability of the brain. It's sort of injured on one side, the other side starts taking over the function. That's how you improve. Um, atrial fibrillation is a, is a condition of the heart where one of the chambers is not pumping correctly. Instead of pumping like it should, it's just fibrillating. And so when that happens, you can develop clots in that chamber, and those clots can go right up to the brain or out to the body. So they found if you got put on a blood thinner, and um, in this case, they were looking at warfarin or coumadin, really a lot, this is stroke prevention, really very effective stroke prevention in most of these trials with atrial fibrillation. Question? Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, TIA being a uh, kind of 
uh, it makes a person uh, more likely to get the stroke. That's right. For how long? For a lifetime? Um, the biggest risk if you have a TIA, uh, so let's define what TIA is. So TIA is you have stroke symptoms but they only last 15 minutes. So let's say you're at home. Suddenly your speech slurs and your face droops and you can't move one side of the body. But that all gets better and goes back to normal in 10 minutes. That's a TIA. It's a transient ischemic attack. It's a warning sign and your question is very good. How long is that? That warning sign is that you're going to have a stroke very soon after that TIA. And soon means within days or the same day. So uh, someone comes in with a TIA, we do the same workup we would do with stroke and put them on an aspirin or make sure the vessels are open or the blood pressure is controlled. They, and depending on how bad this TIA is, we would hospitalize the patient. Having had that event puts, automatically puts them at risk in the future any time of having a stroke. But we know that if we effectively treat that and the person's put on an aspirin, we control the risk factors, have them stop smoking, then that risk gradually goes down over time. But you're at risk the biggest with a TIA, I'd say in the first one to two days after you have that happen. So, if, uh, I'll get to your question in just a second. If you have a TIA, you should call 911 and go to the hospital because you need to be in the hospital for the observation and for the workup. Yes? You mentioned that people can recover from a stroke. So right. if someone has a stroke and loses uh, mobility on one side of their body, for example, how right. long does it typically take for them to recover? Yeah, that's a another good question. Most of the rehab doctors that, that I've worked with, um, the, the, the biggest in recovery is usually in the first six months after a stroke. And you go out to a year. So most of the rehab doctors will say, you have six months is the fastest recovery. You sort of plateau off by a year. And then after a year, there's sort of minimal recovery. I say that it's variable from patient to patient. Certainly the biggest improvement is over six months. You can improve quickly in days or weeks. And some yeah, I know that six month period you'd have to be involved in intensive rehab. Yeah. So the best thing you can do is right after your stroke and after the three to five days that we're watching you in the hospital, go to an acute rehab center where they work with you three to six hours a day and try to get you better. And that's all retraining other parts of the brain to take over that function. So not everybody gets a hundred percent back, but we are we've I've seen Patients come in with really significant weakness on one side where they get enough strength where they can walk again, they can feed themselves. So suddenly the day-to-day -day things become very important that, that we do to be able to function independently. Yes? Are you also the best part of the patient? They should also have to do the practice. Yep. I mean, you could go to rehab and you go for physical therapy, but if you're not going to work on yourself when the physical therapy is not there, that's exactly right. You're going to be at the same risk if you don't stop the risk factors and don't stop smoking and lose weight and control your cholesterol and become an active participant in your own health. And yeah, you stay the same risk as, as if you didn't have any of that done before. So this is a patient, this is a 59-year-old right-handed woman, had recent gastric banding. This is my patient, I took care of this patient. Uh, very nice lady, came in, had gastric banding, uh, obesity, had lost the weight. Post-procedure, right after the procedure, in another hospital, they found a little bit of some AFib on a tracing. She treated with Lovenox, and then um, she did okay for two weeks, but then came to us. She had 10 minutes of slurred speech. She had a left facial droop, left arm was tingling, and she had some mild residual left facial droop only when I saw her. So she came in the emergency room with no symptoms, and about a couple hours later, I saw her, and she only had a left facial droop. And I'm showing you a tracing that shows this atrial fibrillation, so a very irregular heartbeat. That's how the clots form. This is an MRI. Anything white on the MRI, like I showed you, a stroke. She had a very small stroke on the right side of the brain, causing that left-sided problem. But a CAT scan looked pretty normal. So a CAT scan is tendled. MRI is much more sensitive. And then she had a CT angiography here, and it looked okay. These are, this is, um, if you superimpose someone's neck right here, this is the neck and the head, and these vessels are the carotid arteries that live in your neck, and you can get blockage in these arteries. A lot of people, smokers, tend to get blockage in these arteries. Sometimes a surgeon has to go in and open up those arteries and take all that, that plaque out. 
and that's a procedure that's accepted to treat stroke. So um, we found that she was in AFib, and so she needed to be on a blood thinner. We put her on Eliquis, one of the newer blood thinners, and we continued the statin, and she recovered pretty well. So I'm going to skip over the slide, but just to tell you that we, we do extended monitoring if some, we think someone is, uh, might be in AFib. Again, if we don't capture it while they're in the hospital, we may put a monitor on them. And they may wear a monitor for 30 days or longer. They now have implantable monitors that you would wear for years. And it's just looking to capture that AFib in case you're, you're at risk for having a stroke, and then we will put you on a blood thinner if you do have the atrial fibrillation. And these are the newer blood thinners. Um, have you heard of these before? These are, you may know somebody on them. So the Geralto, Eliquis we use in our hospital, Pravaxa. And these take the place of warfarin, because warfarin is an older drug where you have to get your blood tested every week and we're following blood levels. These agents are nice. You don't have to get your blood checked at all. You just take it once or twice a day, and it does the same job as warfarin. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. Let's talk about having a stroke and coming into the emergency room. So it's like, it's like an, it is an emergency, so EMS is called. And in the EMS, they do uh, some simple testing to see if you're having a stroke. Now the EMS will notify the hospital ahead of time. I think I have a stroke. I think we're bringing a stroke into you. They'll notify the primary stroke center. They'll get that call in the emergency room. And we'll get a notification. I get a notification on my cell phone that's emailed to me, stroke code coming into the emergency room, estimated time of arrival. So our stroke team knows. We all get it, whether we're on service or not. So I'm trying to sleep at 2 a.m. and I'm not on service. My phone will go off. You know, it goes along with the territory. But you've got to get to the hospital quickly. And we want to know when the onset of symptoms was. Because everything is time-based. All of our therapy, yes, is time-based. I have to get to the hospital quickly. What if you're in a rural area, a vacation area, on a boat, you're... Uh... Any number of things on vacation, away from, in the bus, so we It's that. tough. Yeah, it's tough. It so let's say you're in a rural area. There is, in most rural areas, let's say New York State, most rural areas know about stroke, and the EMS is going to take you to the closest primary stroke center. That's right. an example. They okay, so you're on a boat. It's away, each way. So say you're on a cruise ship. Uh, I, don't, I don't actually know because most cruise ships don't have a CAT scanner. Some do, though. Some do have a CAT scanner. It's a risk that you take. You're going to be away from the medical care that may treat that stroke. And I, I don't, I'm not an expert in what cruise ships have nowadays or not. They may have the capability of getting TPA on the ship. I don't know. But, you know, if you're in a rural area, there's likely going to be a primary stroke center somewhere within the catchment area of the EMS wherever you are. I had a, I had a, uh, I was, um, I came from Albany Med, that's where I'd set up a practice and I just came down uh, in Jan January 2015, but I was there and I got a call that there was a neurosurgeon out in Tupper Lake, way upstate New York, way, way upstate. And his wife was calling, called the head of neuros, he was a neurosurgeon himself. Wife called the neurosurgery head of my hospital, called me, and said, well, I have this friend of mine who I think is having a stroke. And I said, well, get him here. Can we send a helicopter? No, there's nowhere for a helicopter to land there. So his wife drove him down. And his wife, it took, it took a good three hours to get to my hospital. Fortunately, his symptoms have resolved completely, so he fit the category of a TIA. But he had, actually, on an MRI scan, a very small stroke. And he was resistant, you know, I don't know, I don't mean to knock neurosurgeons, but, you know, they know better than the rest of us. And I've worked with many, so. <laughs> but his wife convinced him to come, and he was very thankful to, to us, to our team. Thank you for, you know, insisting that I come. He had a small stroke, but he was in that same situation, a rural area. There was, they didn't even have an ambulance. They could have, but his wife decided to drive him. But it puts you at risk, you know. It, it depends on where you end up. Um, we want to do all these things, and then this Be Fast acronym. So this is nice to remember, and it's cut off, but it's balance, eyes, face, arm, speech. Any problem with any of that? Balance, you lose your vision, you get weak in an arm, uh, you have a facial droop, your speech is slurred, you want to know what the time is, 
so you know exactly what the, so that we be, uh, there it is, you'd be available for this TPA or something else. I'm gonna just skip over this. This is just, this is outcome scales that we use for stroke. And this is just, these are all the, all the things that we monitor when, you, when someone comes in for a stroke. We're, we, we're held, there's American Heart Association online, I'll get to your question in a second. American Heart Association online service called Get With the Guideline. For every single stroke patient who comes in, we are held to, did they get TPA in time? Did we give them the TPA within 60 minutes? Did we check swallowing? Did we put them on a stroke prevention? Did we prevent clots? So we're held to all of this for every single patient that comes in. Question. You mentioned that symptoms like movement and, and speech and so on droop. If someone loses memory, yeah. does that fall into the category of stroke as well? Uh, they, don't, we, they don't lose movement, they don't lose speech. But memory is a tough thing. So you can, you can lose your memory, quote unquote, when really you're having a speech problem. Do you know what I mean? You, you suddenly you can't speak and you can't, you can't respond. But there's no real there's no real stroke subtype that you suddenly lose your memory. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. So we're talking. Uh, get your question. Say a, a specific stroke. No, but there is a type of syndrome. It's called transient global amnesia, where you can lose your memory suddenly. Had people come come in where they're about to speak, they're at a convention or something. Suddenly they don't know where they are. They don't know what they're doing. They know who they are. They get very agitated because suddenly they don't know why they're there or what they're doing. And it's called transient global amnesia. We don't put that quite under stroke, but it might be a stroke, might be a little seizure, but most of those people recover. They just lose that period of time where they, they could remember. It's a good question. Yes. Uh, Bell's palsy seems to have many of these. Can you differentiate immediately? You can. So, um, so someone who's seen a lot of Bell's palsy and seen a lot of stroke, a Bell's palsy involves the whole face. So the whole face gets weak, the eye gets very open, and you can't close the eye. So the difference between a Bell's palsy and a stroke weakness is stroke weakness is usually the lower half of the face. Bell's palsy affects the whole face. So a trained practitioner, neurologist, emergency room physician who's seen it, we can look at it, Bell's palsy. Sure, we'll get a CAT scan. We may not need it. But sometimes, it's that sometimes the patients don't read the textbook, though. You may see something that looks somewhere between, and then we're thinking, well, I don't know if it's stroke, is it those palsy, and then we do the whole workup, so, yes. Our dad had a stroke and was in our living room for just about two and a half years in a hospital bed, and I'd say in the last four, four or five months, he started what, what we would have considered to be TIs of the esophagus, is there he, such a thing? He didn't have what? I'm sorry? He had strokes of the esophagus. He had closures of the esophagus. He, he may have constriction. Right. Yeah. And, right. And I'm not a gastroenterologist, so he okay. may have constriction of the esophagus. Yeah, but it, it yeah. was periodical. It, it, was, it, was, it was episodic. Like spasms? Yeah, he couldn't, it, the food wouldn't go down. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that is. It may be, but it may be related to. Yeah. It may, uh, two years out, um, it's kind of unusual to have a that kind of delayed problem with swallowing. The swallowing is usually right up front, but it's beyond, you know, what I know, so. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yes? How much of the preliminary treatment can be done inside of the ambulance before the patient gets... Oh, you're trying, to, you're trying to steal my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll show you the last slide. Right, we'll get to that. A little funny problem here. Yeah. Let me, let me just reboot it. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, you know, they talk a lot, a lot about the Mediterranean diet, and I think there's a lot, lots of, lots of uh, substantiation to, the, uh, lots of support for that diet. I think it's got a lot of olive oil and things like that. I think, it, I think it's actually a very good diet. But any diet that controls your weight, controls your diabetes, controls your cholesterol level is all good. And so, what's that? Dairy product. Is what I'm dairy products. Oh, dairy products are okay. Yeah. They're okay. They aren't aren't on our bad list. So you know, I think dairy products are okay. Um, so just so. one more slide, you said. Uh, yeah. Well, we have. I have a couple more, but we'll 
Just keep I talking. Talk. I don't know. It's I can talk. We're booting itself for some reason. Yeah. So uh, yes. I don't know. What's what is the effect of stroke on personality? Oh, real good question. It can have a significant effect. It depends on what part of the brain, which gets to the earlier question. I think if you have a stroke in the frontal part of the brain, the frontal lobe, it can change personality completely. Either make someone who's quiet very active and outgoing, disinhibited, maybe inappropriately so. You can have other parts of the brain affected that change the personality type. Someone may be very conservative and suddenly they're not conservative. They may be very organized and suddenly they're not organized anymore. Or they may just act a little different than the person that you knew. So it certainly can affect memory depending on exactly where the stroke is. Even if, even if basically it seems like most of the effects are very physical, let's say paralyzed arm. Absolutely, yeah. And that there can be subtle personality. There can be. And I've had patients that family say, you know, it's a different person than what I knew. So that can happen as well. It's Murphy's Law today. Okay, uh, that's all right. I'll talk around it. So I'm, I'm just going to continue talking like we have slides up here. And I'll get to your question in just a second. I'll get to the other questions. So um, when we have um, a patient, we have different types of strokes. And until I showed you a stroke, a small little lacunar stroke. We talked about atrial fibrillation. Uh, and strokes in young people, um, auto accidents can cause stroke. You can have a dissection of a blood vessel. Say you're in an auto accident, accident, your head gets turned quickly. One of the line in the lining of the vessels and these vessels in the neck can get injured, and you can have a stroke that way. So one of the slides I was going to show you was a young person had a stroke. She was 22, and she had a stroke. Automobile accident. Three days later, came in with a big stroke. Was in a neuro ICU. Had lots of complications, and she recovered nicely. So. Um, certainly age, age does help at a stroke at a young age. A lot of these patients get, get better. But the key is really, we mentioned, is rehab immediately after your stroke. So the sooner you get to rehab, the better. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of it's driven, the, the duration of the rehab is driven by insurance, unfortunately. But a lot of people get one, two, three weeks of rehab that's really going to help. So what I was going to show you, so we talked about TPA. So I'll go ahead and jump, jump to like the last slide. So uh, we now have what's called a mobile stroke unit. Has anybody heard of this? Mobile stroke unit. So New York City got, was the sixth city in the country. I'm supposed to stand in front of this, sorry. Uh, New York City was the sixth city in the country that got this mobile stroke unit in, uh, in last year. So, and it's been running since October of last year. And what it is, is an EMS, a regular EMS ambulance, but it has a CAT scanner on board. So, um, one of my neurologists, Dr. Michael Rario, is a medical director of this, and they spent a lot of work in New York City working with FDNY, the fire department, EMS, and have now a whole triage. So if you're in Manhattan, and you call 911, and you have a stroke, and you're in either the Cornell or Columbia catchment area, so Upper East Side, Upper West Side. This mobile stroke unit is going to come to your house. And it's going to come to your house with a neurologist on board. And I've ridden on this mobile stroke unit about five times. It's pretty cool. I find it very cool, very exciting. You go to the person's house. You go into the house. As a neurologist, we do the assessment. Someone could be in their living room. They could be actually in a church. We've gone to a couple of churches. We've gone into, into stores. Someone having a stroke right then and there, we do the assessment. The patient then gets, we say, yeah, I think it's a stroke. They get, they get taken outside into the EMS. They get their CAT scan there. If we think they're a TPA candidate, we'll give a TPA right there. So we've cut the time from going to the emergency room and getting the whole workup to getting right into the EMS van, getting all the work up and getting TPA by almost an hour of treatment. And believe me, for as a stroke neurologist, that's, that's a lot of time. So this is very exciting technology. And we're, New York City is, again, one of six cities in the, in the country to get this. Uh, there's two more of these, we call them buses, coming. One is going to be Cornell, and actually Queens is going to get the other one. So we're very excited. And this will happen the beginning of next year. Yes? What's your experience with solar ambulances versus FDNY ambulances? Do they have more sophisticated equipment? No, I think it depends. It depends on the training of the EMTs, honestly, and who rides on them. 
And so a lot of a lot of us are going, you know, in the country, spend a lot of time with EMTs and go give talks similar to this one. And excuse me, talk to them, and they're very enthusiastic and want to learn. And so really the, 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 the overall, I think the overall experience is very good. They know a stroke, they use one of those scales. I don't know if you saw this slide, there's a lap scale, there's a Cincinnati scale. Very simple scale that they use. Do you have facial droop, arm weakness, speech changes? If you have all three, there's about a 90% chance you're having a stroke. And they will notify the stroke center and they know to take the patient to the primary stroke center, a certified stroke center. So who gets there first? I saw the FDA line. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, every once in a while I get this stuff in the mail from some private company that says that they can do some kind of a test of the carotid arteries. Right. So that you know that right. whether or not they're recluded. Is right. there anything to it? Because apparently it's not covered by insurance. It's not. And it's another super question. It's a good question. Um, I would say that, that it, unless you have risk factors and unless you've had, say you've had a heart attack in the past, or say you have uncontrolled high blood pressure, diabetes, it might be worth that. Uh, I don't, you know, they, they try to make it so you don't shell out too much money out of your pocket. It could be $99, $150, but I think the yield is quite low. The yield is low. I think the yield is low with those tests. If you haven't had some type of problem before, uh, the chances of picking up a carotid narrowing that you never knew you had and you don't have high blood pressure or diabetes or any of the risk factors is going to be extremely low. So, yes? Um, can a TIA affect walking? It can. In what way? Um, you can get imbalanced and you can't walk. Uh -huh. So remember, a TIA is a very brief symptoms of stroke. Right. Stroke or TIA can both affect balance. So walking. Suddenly you can't walk. And and that affects the back, that can affect the back part of the brain that's, that's responsible just for balance. So you, your speech may be okay, you may have vision okay, but you lose your balance. So again, that's, we have a low threshold, 911, 911, 911. You think something's going on in 911, better to be in a hospital, uh, you know, better safe than sorry, as they say. Better be in a hospital if you think something's going on, you actually have something, but we can treat it. So we have... At my hospital, at New York Presbyterian Queens, we have four stroke neurologists. We're primary stroke center. We're gearing up to do this endovascular, and one of a couple of slides I was going to show you was pulling clots out of uh, brain vessels. So um, this was, I, from a historical standpoint, uh, we talked about, Dr. Bright mentioned some of the history of stroke. I talked about being a resident, and the TPA study came out in 1995, FDA approved 1996. The study is showing that it's beneficial to pull clots out of brain vessels. Believe it or not, the only, only st that studies came out that were positive in 2015. In fact, that technology was going away, even though hospitals did it. Studies came out, five studies in a row that were positive, brought it back, and insurance companies are now interested. So a lot of hospitals are moving to having that technology. Let me give you an example of the sort of the flow that would happen. Your cousin sitting in front of you, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, they slump over. They have slurred speech. You look, everybody looks at their watch because they've been to this, this talk, and you notice the time. You call EMS, 911. They get there in five minutes. They look at your cousin. Looks like a stroke. They do their study, the lab study. Oh, it looks like a stroke. Now, uh, speech problem, arm weakness, slurred speech. They take the patient to the hospital. The hospital arrive of the patient. Patient arrives in the emergency room at a stroke center. Immediately, the emergency room will call a stroke code. The stroke team comes down, and they're supposed to see the patient within 15 minutes of arrival. And this is really what happens. We're, we're pre-notified, so we know someone's coming in, and we know when they're going to get there. So stroke team arrives. The patient goes to a CAT scan. A CAT scan I showed you, they, they see if it's negative. And if it's negative, they do, they do a score, which I put up there, and I didn't want to go in detail, about how severe the stroke is. And they decide the patient's having a stroke. CAT scan is negative. It's not a bleed type of stroke. We're going to give the patient TPA. So we're looking at our watches. Onset was at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's now 10 o'clock, two hours. We're within the four and a half hour window. We give the patient TPA. We monitor them very closely for changes in exam. 
because TPA does have a small risk of causing bleed into the brain where that stroke is. And, you know, find some wood, but knock on wood, not quite wood. I'll but, your uh, flash right in a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, patient it does okay, but within that time period, we're thinking, what else can we do for that patient? So we send them back to a CAT, another CAT scan with dye, and we notice they have a blockage in a brain vessel. So now we're going to send them up to the angio suite. So they already got their TPA, they got the blood the clot buster already given, and now within the next hour, they're going to go up to the angio suite, and they're going to take a catheter in the groin, take them all the way up to the blood vessel, and pull that clot out. And that's, that's where we are right now. And it can be very effective. So, so effective that you can come in with a very severe stroke. And within getting the TPA and getting that clot pulled out of the brain vessel, you can return completely to normal. So, and this happens on the table sometimes. The, the interventionalist is pulling a clot out of the brain vessel. Someone starts talking and moving aside, and it's a miracle. You know, that's what we, that's what we want to see. Yes? If you say that the dye can show immediately, why don't we do it immediately with the dye? The dye. So what I meant was that's given to look at the blood vessel and see what blood vessel is blocked. So they go up and they inject. It's called dye, but it shows up. It goes into the blood vessel. I don't know if you remember that first picture I showed you. The blood wasn't going past that vessel. That was um, dye in the blood vessel. Okay. Is that what you're up to? Or? Yeah. We'll, let's see. I'm sorry about that. No, this is good. We'll, we'll continue. I'm gonna, I talked about this already. This was just a, a man who... You know what they say, to error is human, but it takes a computer to really... <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Small stroke in the back part of the brain, and so we're going to move on. Let's see. This is a picture of flying in, I don't know not where I was flying back from, but I love the view. So you go way out here and you turn around and come into LaGuardia. TPA. So TPA, like I said, 1995 is when we reviewed that that journal had the journal club and talked about it. It's given within three hours, but now it's four and a half hours. And there's a slight increased risk of hemorrhage when you give TPA. TPA is pretty good for opening up vessels, but it doesn't open up big vessels. So that's where you would go up to the angio suite and get that clot pulled out by one of the international radiologists. And I'll skip over. This just was a study that extended the window to give TPA to four and a half hours. So you have to know when the onset of the stroke was. If you go to bed the night before and say the family noticed you were okay around 10 o'clock the night before, and you wake up with a stroke, we're going to say the stroke happened at 10 p.m. the night before, and you'll be outside the window. But things are changing rapidly with strokes, so we may use one of those images to see if we can determine exact time. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, if a person is given the TPA, let's say, Five hours after. Is it simply not effective or just less effective? The studies have shown that bleeding risk goes up after four and a half hours. So we never give it past four and a half hours. Okay. Yeah, it, our cutoff, we're very strict about our times. Okay. So the bleeding risk goes up after four and a half hours. And even with the endovascular treatment, we have an eight hour window. We don't want to go past that. Okay? This just shows you exactly. So we have a time window. The best. Time to give the TPA is very early in the stroke, and there's three hours, and there's four and a half hours. Time is brain, that's our mantra. Kind of move quickly. So secondary stroke prevention, we're gonna talk about. So we have a goal, if your cholesterol, your LDL, that's the bad cholesterol, is greater than 100 and you've had a stroke, you need to be on a medication called a statin. And not for six months, but for life. You need to be on it, even if you, have it, you control your diet and you do everything. Statin is very protective, independent of all the other agents, uh, in protective against stroke recurrence. So you should be on your statin indefinitely. Uh, we use certain agents for blood pressure control. And then we use mostly clopidogrel and aspirin. And we're not, is 81 milligrams as good as 325? I'm not sure. We use a lot of 81 milligrams of stroke prevention. It seems to work. And this just shows you one of the agents, Ramapro, which is a type of blood pressure called the ACE inhibitor, has also has an independent effect of reducing stroke despite being on other agents. And this is from a movie. Oh, this is, I, I loaded the wrong one. That's okay. This is from a movie called Blades of Glory. And this is a figure skating movie, and we'll get to the importance of that at the end. 
carotid disease. I said these vessels in the neck. We do ultrasound to look at those vessels and see uh, exactly um, if there's blockage. And most of the time we use medical management, but if the blockage is 70% or more, then that you can have surgery to open up those ve the vessel. Here, this shows right here, this is a very narrow carotid. So this is the neck here, and this is the head up here. A very narrow carotid artery, and that may be something you want to operate on because it's very, very narrow. Then you open it up, you get the blood flow back. Skip over this. I was in Abbey Road where the Beatles were. This is the young woman I was telling you about. Had a, had a motor vehicle accident, came in, and here's an section. See that vessel, it just doesn't look right. And it's actually missing here. And I've got some arrows to show you. Her stroke was here in the back part of the brain, so-called posterior circulation stroke. And that's where her vessel was supposed to be, but it was gone because there was a dissection in the back part of the neck. And she actually recovered pretty well. So in 2015, like I said, the thrombectomy case the trials came out that were positive. Uh, I, was, I happened to be sitting in the room the American Heart Association. We have an international stroke conference once a year, and it's gotten bigger and bigger, so now there's 4,000 attendants, and we were in this huge ballroom, and they're about to announce the studies for these thrombectomy, and you can hear a pin drop, and they announce the studies. It was truly histor history happening before our eyes, because this was the next step in our treatment for stroke, pulling clots out of brain vessels, and these studies are very positive. This is what it looks like. So this is the, this is the catheter. This is a, a vessel way up in the brain, and there's a clot sitting there, and this is the catheter that goes up and grabs the clot, pulls it back in the little microcatheter, and that's what it looks like, not to, that's the junk that they pull out of your brain, it keeps you from having a stroke. Does it have a camera? Uh, it doesn't, no it doesn't, but but they're doing it, they're looking at, they're, they have a patient in the angiosphere, a big fluoroscope that they move around that gives exactly the picture of where they are and what they're doing. It's like a continuous angiogram and they can see and navigate exactly where they are. So this is an example. So there's a big clot here, this is a blood flow, there's no blood flow. And this is after treatment, they've opened it up pretty good. It's not 100%, but much better blood flow here. And the device is called a solitaire device. These are the studies, there's a lot of information, uh, but um, they're all very big strokes that they treated, and they all did really well. This shows some of the times to treat it. And again, along, just like with TPA, the quicker you give it, the better. With thrombectomy, the quicker you get that clot out of the brain, the better, and that was shown by this study. So we look at comparisons, so in medicine, we look at how effective a treatment is, and we use the number needed to treat. So how many patients do we need to treat to be effective in our treatment? And so the NN, NNT, number needed to treat, if we're talking about TPA, you need to treat eight patients to prevent one major stroke. With endovascular, you only need to treat three patients to treat one major stroke, so very effective. And so now we have TPA, the neuroendovascular treat stroke, which is moving along quite nicely. This is where the patient goes for the endovascular. So they lie on this, is like, it's like a bed, hospital bed, but this huge machine is big fluoroscope that moves around in three-dimensional space where you can see, and you shoot an angiogram, you see exactly where you are. And you can see, if you can see back here, it shows you kind of what a picture would look like doing that. Uh, so that's not invasive, I take it. It is invasive, it is. They're going through the groin and they're going up into the brain, so it has, has risks. Um, so the future stroke is now. We have neurovascular. We'll be doing our first case this year. Uh, we are a joint commission primary stroke center. We got, uh, CMS. we got the designation in April of this year, and we're looking for telemedicine. And so the mobile stroke that I told you about, this is what it looks like. So it's a van, it's an EMS. But in this, you can see back here there's a CAT scanner. So the patient goes in to the van, they get the CAT scan, you, give it, you hang TPA, and they're treated immediately. Is back, a, at, back at the major, yeah? It's a tough question, but um, does insurance pay for that? Uh, it, it pays for it. It's sort of, it's, it's set up like this is an emergency room visit. 
So, so going into this and getting treated is taking the same as going to the emergency room. You won't get a bill for ten thousand dollars. No, no, no. So we've got gotten around that. that uh, it's a good question. It's not the bill that you get after all of this. And someone in the hospital, you can do this telemedicine, so you don't necessarily have to have a neurologist writing on the man. You can be back at the hospital. There's a camera up here, and you do the exam, and you give the TPA, and you're looking at all the very parts of, of the exam. Uh, so this, just I'll finish up. This is my wife and daughter. My wife is a doctor.